Alec, quick question. For SIA, how do you find, as you're rolling it out in some of your proof of concept and field trials in the downstream market, how, how are you gaining trust from the workforce? You know, they're used to asking something at home, but how do you get them to trust that the data that you've crunched is giving them the right answer? Yeah, there's, there's sort of two parts to that. There's getting building trust to the point where they actually want to implement the solution within their firm. And then once they have implemented it, you know, how do we ensure, how do they ensure that they're getting accurate answers? So the first part, uh, the way that we've overcome that hurdle, um, people didn't really believe that we could do what we said, but we got founded out of uh, the software consultancy because enough of the clients independently had been coming in saying, yikes, we're losing our subject matter experts. How can we create some sort of surrogate that people can can you know get information for us so that they're, they're not, we're not slowing down the decision making process or putting pressure on the uh, on, on under informed decisions? We had to kind of you know beg and plead right at first and say like, hey, we, we can just make this tool that does this. And it wasn't until they saw what it could do that they sort of like bought into it. And now it's just having precedence and you know being able to be on a stage like this thanks to you and you know build some credibility that way. Um, also, the, the free tool really helps. I think when people play around with it, they can it helps them understand what they can do. Once they're once we've integrated, once we're in, inside of the firm, when people ask questions, they don't just get back answers. There's metadata attached, so they can see, you know, here's the specific answer, but here's the paragraph that that answer came from. They can open that file and see who wrote it and when it was written. So it kind of helps them to get some sense of like where that answer is coming from. Also, by the time an end user is using it, it's been pre-trained by somebody who was a subject matter expert in their firm, which tends to go a lot faster than uh, some of the other companies that are doing things a little bit like that. So all of those things together help the end user feel pretty confident that they're getting good uh, results. One quick thing to add to that, every now and then, uh, discrepancy is discovered through the use of the tool, and that's actually a positive for the firm because if there's competing best practices for the same kind of issue or problem within the firm, we might help to flag that. And then the engineer who discovered it can get some credit for it and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm seeing here in this case from this document that I should do this, and I'm seeing this over here. That's the kind of thing you can escalate to a subject matter expert. Hey, Sean, can I get back Please. to Mary's question? I mean, how about an HR application? Uh, or an HR, uh, um, not, not solution, but, but use case for your uh, so solution. Yeah, thank you. That, that's uh, generous queuing there. Yeah. There's, there's two that we've seen. <laughs> we, uh, I promise we just met, but I like this guy. Uh, one thing that we were doing for a, a retiring subject matter expert at, at Lindy, this is an HR related thing. We're all worried about losing these people. You know, I talked about the big crew change at the beginning of my presentation there. When those people step away, People have to fill their shoes off and don't have that same expertise. So, uh, if we can avoid having to hire back that subject matter expert at some multiple of their per hour salary, that's an HR related thing. And that's, that's what we're doing with this person who's retiring from Lindy. We thought that there would be some resistance on behalf of the subject matter expert. Instead, they like it because they get to sort of leave behind a nice legacy. Um, and they care about their team and they, you know, they don't want to answer questions at 2 in the morning anymore. But they also want to be able to do their high value added work without having to spend a large portion of their day answering questions from people like me. Um, so that's, that's one. The second is sort of this onboarding and training process. Uh, and so that's something that we've been doing with the ASF. When people are new to a job, uh, in, in this case they're fluidized catalytic cracking tech service engineers. So they've sold catalysts into third-party oil refineries. And those refineries expect from them very high-quality reports on how to optimize the performance of those catalysts. That's tough. Uh, and if they come up with an answer themselves, what if that answer conflicts with their pre predecessor's answer? We need like nice, consistent, and uh, accurate you know, results across all of the new documents that are being created and new reports that are generated. So those are two sort of HR related. Excellent, thank you. Got a question here from Dimitri. Alec, I have a, a question for you. Are you currently returning results based on company by company by company subject matter experts? And do you have any plans to essentially data warehouse or, or 
accumulate all of that subject matter expertise to be able to provide it holistically as a, a response based on the accumulation of all those subject matter experts at all those various different organizations. You know, when I was first thinking about this, back when I was working for an oil company, that's what I had in mind. I liked that idea that it could be some you know, giant sort of holistic knowledge base that everyone could tap. The reality is that oil companies and most companies and most industries really like their data. Their biggest asset is their data. That's more and more recognized in oil and gas, so we're very careful never to share like somebody in company A asks a question, they would never get an answer from companies B, company B's you know, information. Um, nor do we even incorporate that information into generally how we are going to change our tool. So we're having to build our own knowledge base internally uh, as a way to help uh, make sure that our, our answers are accurate off the bat for each new client. But we silo their, their data. So that's that's the unfortunate um, kind of truth there. I will say, we, you know, with that, the finding online that open source thing that that we uh, created, um, we're looking into doing something like that for upstream. So there's the Slumberger uh, oil field glossary is a, is a nice target perhaps, or maybe something inside of the Texas Railroad Commission. So if anybody in here has any ideas about a tool that uh, makes use of public data, they could benefit from having like uh, uh, cognitive uh, function on, on some chatbot, then, then you know, come to me after. So you can see, see I can't quit, take all the files and go to the competition. <laughs> yeah, see I can't do that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of concern sometimes with we'll see it replace people's you know jobs. And we think we're a very, very long way away from that. Because you need a human to look through just because the, the, the chatbot has come up with some relevant things. That the, you know, well researched uh, decision making is, is what we're providing, not the actual decisions. C is not how, right? Yeah. Open the pod is the poor. Yeah. Quick question then. So to Will and Matt, uh, quick question. As you have customers and clients roll out the various tools that you built for them, whether it's RPA or an AI or ML enabled tool or technology, what's made it more successful? What do you think are some of the key characteristics? Versus uh, ones that may not have rolled out quite as well. And what do companies need to do to get their leadership, their workforce ready to, to basically adopt the technology you're creating for them? Can I go first? Sure. So, so it's, a, it's a very good question. So I think you know, with RPA, uh, the, the the key feature of it is it's very very easy to roll out. Right? We can we can go you know start talking to the company. Few weeks later, we can have a robot that is that is working within the company. But the, but the issue is scaling, right? The issue is scaling and uh, and making sure that it provides business value uh, to the company. I think I'm, I'm going to echo you know, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, people that were here you know, before uh, during this day, and that proper change management uh, is is really crucial to RPA success. Uh, you know, we, we we take care of a lot of things on the IT side, right? But we can't take. Uh, uh, we, I mean, we help, but we can't really take care of the uh, of, of the people aspect. Uh, you know, the, the robotic process automation kind of sounds scary. You know, robots taking over the world. Uh, it's, it's it's really important that the, that the leadership, um, the top leadership, and and, and, and and the people we work with, uh, really steer it into the direction that it becomes. A very useful tool for the workforce, and not some sort of competition or something that they don't want to be engaged with. Yeah, I'd say uh, a little bit of a, a, a rhyme. I, I would say don't let integration stifle your innovation, um, and you know, figure out what the right solution is, and then worry not worry about, but then figure out how to integrate it into the system. And a quick example, and a, and a, a nod and. I guess a humble brag. You know, there's a small Netherlands company on the re downstream retail side we've been fortunate to build uh, on-demand mobile fueling for. And there's two specialized trucks rolling around here in, in Houston where you will soon be able as a consumer to, on your phone, we think it actually would go to a conversational intelligence type plate, where you're able to order fuel, 87, 93, or diesel, and it will come to your, to your car. This particular company, has a specific 
uh, IT system already in place. But they said, hey, let's not worry about integrating into our structure while we're figuring out what's the best solution, what's the best technique and the best algorithms from an AI perspective, and then what does the user experience really look like? Uh, versus those that are saying, nope, this round hole or square hole has to have this type of peg in order for it to, to work. That's where we've seen the most successful solutions being rolled out uh, when we solve the problem first and then figure out how to integrate it into the larger system. So we're still open for questions. If anyone has questions or wants to get their car fueled up before the reception, <laughs> sounds like that's imminent coming through. So I'm going to ask, uh, here's a question that we had uh, from our community when we talked about this session. Uh, they wanted to know, in general, what's the workforce, in your opinions, what's the workforce supposed to expect in the next year or two from these types of technologies? Uh, what, what is their expectation? Is this an enabler? Is it an augmenter? Is it a threat? I mean, you obviously have your good position on it, but how do we help the workforce understand how these can be helpful? I'd say that for people in my generation or younger, they're already excited about this. They're the kind of people who stop by our booth whenever we're at a conference like this and don't leave. You know, and they write back and, you know, they're sort of internal champions. Um, it, the, the challenge uh, with workforce that we've faced so far is that people of um, the generation that's about to leave the industry, where there's a lot of value to be added with a tool like this, um, have trouble understanding the implication of a categorical solution like ours. And so we need to find specific use cases that are relevant to them in order to get them on board. So instead of just saying like, hey, there's this tool and it can sort of act like you in response to questions, they like the idea of a, of a buffer and they like the idea of less people coming to them with, with simple questions that are repetitive. But it's hard for them to understand that the tool can really do what we say it can. And so we can give them a use case that makes sense in their, their specific domain. So that's kind of the, that's been the challenge so far. I think that, you know, when it comes to like a message that I suppose I'd like to get out there to, to people in, in both of those positions, um, I'd, I'd say play around with these sorts of tools more. There's a lot of like open source stuff that starts to do little bits of what we have figured out over the last like three years. Um, and you can get a sense of like what value could be added on your own. And uh, then there's, there's kind of nothing to fear. This is not going to replace you. This is going to enable you. You'll learn faster. I think in most companies, the expectation is people will switch their jobs more and more quickly in the future. That'll continue to be true, I think, at least for the next couple of years. So how do you onboard faster in your, your role? Um, embrace a tool like this, and I think you'll be, you'll be better equipped to add value during 